Hi friends, welcome to Harmony Hills Home and Garden. I'm Jenny, and normally we're gardening in Baltimore, Maryland, which is in Zone 7, but today I am visiting my family members. This is my sister-in-law, Anne, and we are in Brewster, Massachusetts, out on Cape Cod, about mid-Cape, right? Yep. Yep. And um, Anne's going to show us around her garden. She's got a one-acre property here, roughly. Um, she lives with my brother-in-law, Rob, her husband, and they have a beautiful home here, and so I'm excited to share Anne's garden with you today. So come with us and let's take a look. Okay, so Anne, you live on about an acre here right. in Brewster, Massachusetts, and that's on Cape Cod. And so uh, you've been here how long? Uh, I think coming up on 14 years. Okay, 14 years here. And so you've done a lot of gardening in that time frame, right? Yeah. And some trees have come down since then, and your one acre is about uh, one third woods in the back. and looks like you've got some woods here in the front as well and then you've got the house and the lawn around the house and gardens around that so let's get started um, I'm gonna turn the camera around and Anne's gonna show us around her property okay so Anne, we're out here on the street in front of your beautiful house and beautiful property so walk us through a little bit what it looked like when you moved in 14 years ago and what you have done out here well um when we bought it, there were a lot of gardens installed around the house, and there is also an automatic irrigation system. Oh, nice. So that kind of determines a lot of how you're going to garden, I've yeah, learned. Yeah, sure. Um, so this strip, this is our street here. This is a strip along the street. Um, there was nothing here. I guess the former owner planted annuals here. There is irrigation heads on it. But I just decided... Um, to go all shrubs along the street just uh -huh. for, uh, uh, you know, a little less maintenance and some right. year-round interest. So. Right. So you have um, hydrangeas here. Which kind of hydrangeas are these? Uh, yep. They're uh, Proven Winners, Let's, Let's Dance Series, uh, Rhythmic Blue. Nice. And they've got these beautiful pinkish-purplish bloom heads. That, these are the fall color, of course, but in the right. season. It's very, very deep blue. They will be anywhere from very deep blue through uh, like a purplish pink. Uh -huh. Do you have any trouble with deer in your property here? Oh yeah, it, like everything here is highly selected for not being eaten by deer. Over the years, I've had plants that, you know, I researched them, they're on the deer resistant list and they don't last 24 hours. Wow. I think those deer come through here every night. And they don't eat your hydrangeas? Uh, they don't, they occasionally, when it's, you know, when the buds are nice and full, they will occasionally nip off some buds. Huh. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm surprised that they kind of leave them alone. There's hydrangeas, Cape Cod, there's hydrangeas everywhere. So maybe it's just like boring for them, I don't know. <laughs> I wish they'd be bored with my hydrangeas. But these are nice, I when when we moved here, there were a lot of the traditional Nico blue uh -huh. ranges, which mm -hmm. are the real big shrub size, uh, not ever blooming ones. Right. And I ended up getting rid of all those because they grow to an enormous proportions. But if you prune them back at all, you because they bloom on old wood, they wouldn't bloom. Right. So I got rid of those and I went to all these smaller size, they're ever blooming ones. Okay. So even if the, the branches get broken off or they get nipped off by a deer or killed off by unusually cold weather, they will still grow back and bloom every year. Because they bloom on both old and new wood. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Cool. And then what is this evergreen that you have in between the hydrangeas? These, that's a, that's a heath plant, a winter heath. I think it's a winter beauty. Uh, it's got a winter beauty. Winter heath. Yeah, that's a white one and then two others are pink. So they're getting ready to put, put out their flowers. They bloom about February. I oh, okay. Start. Got it done by Memorial Day. And they're softer than they look, I think. Yeah. But you don't a, spend time petting them. Yeah. <laughs> they're another plant. They're deer and rabbit resistant, and um, they're they do really well in Cape Cod. Nice. Cool. But, well, it's beautiful out here against the beautiful grass, and then the woods here. So in the woods, these are mostly a natural wood, right? Yes. And so what are these trees here? Uh, most, there's predominantly oaks, mostly black oaks with a few white oaks. And then white pines? Uh, pitch pines. Pitch pines, okay. And then the understory back in here, you've got um, some winterberry, you told me, and clethra, yep. usually yep. wild in here. Yep, and a lot of blueberries, high bush and low bush blueberries are everywhere out in the woods here. Okay. 
great. So you've got this undeveloped wooded area with the edging of the shrubs, which is really beautiful. And then of course the house back in behind there. Um, and then the same probably down on the other side of the driveway. Yeah, I have a couple of rhododendrons down there. They're another thing that seems to do really well in Cape Cod. All right, let's go take a look. All right, so here we are on the other side of the driveway, and you've got some rhododendrons and then another of the beautiful hydrangeas. Yeah, that's the same kind of hydrangeas as over there. These are, they're called yak rhododendrons. It's short for a Japanese term. Okay. I think these are yak princess. They have white blooms in the spring. Uh -huh. They do really well there. Okay. Um, this stuff behind here is uh, bayberry. Bayberry. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, I don't candle think. Fame. That's a native plant. It, it, there's lots of bayberry in the woods here too, but I think these were planted by the original landscaper. Okay. You've got a holly tree back here that you brought from another property. Yep, that's right. That's a that's an English holly. English holly. That have the big spiky leaves. Okay. There's also a few American hollies. There's a couple back there, and I've seen those growing out in the woods here too. So and here's nice. this is another English one that's here. English holly. Do they bury pretty prolifically? Um. I'm not seeing so them yet. The one back there does, because they have to be back female. behind there. Yeah, this one. Yeah. This one has some. Yeah. Only the females have the berries. So. Uh huh. This one might be a male. I don't think I've seen ever seen any berries. Well, them. let's. I do see something. Yep. That's got a few. There we are. Yep. And then the American holly back there has quite a few berries. There she is. And then this is a winter berry holly, where you can show the one in the back. There's a little dwarf one. That's a natural one. So these are um, probably native to Cape Cod. Yes. These a, winter berries here. Yeah, yeah, that's a natural one that just grew there. Um, and they're all through the woods, all yeah. over the Cape. And, uh, and then, of course, there are cultivars that are bred for specific traits and things. And we'll see an example of that in the backyard. All right. So... Um, so your front yard is beautiful. It's mostly wooded, but then also just really nice swaths of lawn. So that's really well put together. I, I just love this property. You know? oh, I just you. have to say, I yeah. love it so much. The layout was here when we bought it. We didn't design that. But... Um, let's go look at the rock wall garden. Okay. All right, so you have this beautiful rock wall, the stacked walls. If you've never been to New England, I highly recommend that you come to New England and experience the beauty of this region. But um, these stacked stone walls, this is just a small example, but you will find them everywhere in New England. And it's because back when, I guess, the English settlers and the first colonization efforts, um, farmers were starting to plow their fields and they kept finding rocks and find more rocks and more rocks. And this happens in England and other places on the globe. Globe, of course, but in New England, the stack stone um, walls are a dominant feature. And you have a beautiful here one here on the driveway, don't you? Yep. 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 Again, <laughs> came with the house, so yes, but yeah, it's a nice feature. Yep. Okay, so you've got a garden going on here. It's a raised bed, effectively, although yes. it's just a natural extension of the landscape at some point. Um, so probably they uh, excavated to make the house and there was an elevation change, so they put in this wall. Um, and so back in behind part, you've got whatever was here, natural right. yeah. wooded area, but then you've um, put things into the front. Why don't you give us a look around what you have here? This is a, this is a clethra, this is a hummingbird clethra, which is a uh, cultivar that's bred to be um, shorter and kind of more resistant to flopping than the, the species. Okay. Um, these is that have, also called summer sweet? Yes. Okay. Yep. And uh, it has, uh, in August, it gets really nice uh, white blooms on all these, what are seed pods now. Mm -hmm. Really lovely scent. Um, you walk around here, it's throughout the woods also, the wild kind. So you walk around, you can smell it in August. Nice. Really nice odor. That's nice. Aroma, I guess. Um, I planted these hellebores here. Um, there's a patch yep. there, yep. over here. Um, they do really well. Um, one thing about Cape Cod, or at least this area, um, with all the oaks and the pine trees, the soil is highly acidic. Mm -hmm. And if you have stuff that doesn't like acidic soil, it's probably not gonna do well. It's also so, really sandy. That too, yeah. There's no clay. It's really good drainage, which is good. Um, but those hellebores, I do have to put a little lime on them to keep them healthy. Okay. Um, and another of the um, yep, same the, hydrangea. Same hydrangea. And then what's this down from? Uh, that's a kaleidoscope abelia. 
Um, it's uh, doesn't. It's supposed to be a low but spreading form. Um, that one doesn't have a lot of color, but some of these others have. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a green, but it also has red and yellow tints all year. Oh, all year um, long. And it's highly deer resistant again. Good. And here's one that's blooming. This yeah. is the same one, Kaleidoscope yes. abelia. And it has pretty little white blooms with the pink calyxes, so lots of color. And then a lot of the leaf tips, especially the new growth, it looks like, yep. are the pink. But it, you say it holds all yeah, summer. Yeah, it's, it's that been color. like that. The, at least the more mature ones. That one of these is a newer plant, and it's not quite as developed. Maybe the older leaves got more color. I don't know. Gotcha. But, and then more clethra, more uh, hellebores, more hydrangea, more abelia, more clethra, more hellebores. And so you've got a really beautiful repetition coming along this whole garden. Let me get back so we can kind of see it from end to end. But it just really gives a nice um, a feeling of uh, rhythm and repeat down this border. And it's beautiful all seasons because you've got spring bloomers with the hellebores. And then you bring in the hydrangeas and the abelia and the clethra. And they all bloom at different times, right? Yeah. And so you have scent and you have color. And it's really lovely. Thank you. Really pretty and real, well done. This is this is the winter berry that just comes grows out of the woods, but it stays low. So I just I just leave that in this garden. It's an evergreen. Nice. And I'll I'll give you one. Another thing we did was when we moved here, all the gardens were mulched with a bark mulch, uh -huh. typical brown bark mulch. But um, because we have all these pine trees, it's this constant rain of pine needles down. Mm -hmm. So we always had bark mulch with pine needles on top of mm -hmm. it. And eventually I decided to save some work just to give up on that and mm -hmm. go with the flow. And so now I buy baled pine needles. And that's available here. Really. Yes, it's available here. Yeah. yeah. We had that in Raleigh. You could get yes. a lot of that. And they call it pine straw. Yes. Um, but in Maryland, it's not so much a natural resource for right. us there. So. Yeah. But it works out great here because it blends in with the, what naturally falls. So. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it makes your garden life easier and um, yeah. maybe saves you some money also. Maybe not. Probably about the Probably same. Probably not. Probably I will wash. say, I think I use less of this than we use the bark mulch. It lasts longer. It does last longer. Yeah. yeah. And it kind of like uh, weaves itself together yeah. into, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, erode. Right, like it, it lets the water through too. It doesn't, yeah. you know, seal out the water. Yeah. Which in this garden is important because there's a tendency to just run off. Yeah. And some folks are, are concerned that using pine needles as a mulch will acidify your soil. It probably does, but it's so acidic to begin with. Well, and also I just read just this morning that actually it's really only the top inch or two of your soil that's affected and it's seasonally affected and um, so if you have alkaline soil that you're trying to acidify it's not necessarily going to work to use pine bark or sorry pine straw as a mulch as the only way to try to acidify your soil because it really only affects the top layers that's what i learned that's this morning anyway okay let's look at the foundation plantings that you have to your front okay let's go So another hydrangea is the same one? It's not. It's a uh, Proven Winners Let's, Let's Dance Blue Jangles. Okay. Uh, it gets a little bit bigger than the other ones, and it's more of a, the other one is more of a blue to purple bloom. This is a more of a blue to, like light blue to pink. Okay. It's a little slightly, subtly different. All right. And these haven't kept as much color no, as some of the not. other ones. Um, so yeah, I think for color retention, the other one does a little bit better. Yeah. And then these green shrubs behind. What those are those? Those are potentillas. They have bright yellow flowers from, uh, you know, July through August. They flower very profusely. They might be gold storm or something. Okay. That's the name. But they are, um, they're really good. Um, the key to these things is uh, you need to prune them back really aggressively. They're deciduous. So when they lose their leaves in the winter, you know, I prune them back so they're like a foot high. Uh -huh. um, and that keeps them lush and brings a lot of bloom the next year. Uh -huh. And if you watched my video series when I was in Minnesota in September, you may remember that my daughter-in-law Beth and I went to a, a garden center and I saw Potentilla on the shelf for sale and I was shocked to see that it was hardy down to zone two. And that was a whole big deal in that video. But anyway, yeah, Potentilla is great for a northern garden, which Let's talk about your zone for a second, because out here on Cape Cod, I expected you to be more like a zone 
four or five is what I was kind of expecting. But what what hardiness zone are you here on Cape Cod? Uh, it's up. To, I've read different things, but I think it's kind of a six B to seven. Some wow. people consider it. Believe it or not. And that's because of the oceanic um, temperate uh, air that comes in off the ocean. You don't really get as much cold or snow as you do inland in Massachusetts or over into Connecticut, right? Right. Or Rhode Island even. Although Rhode Island is probably coastal as well, probably. mostly. Yeah. So here on Cape Cod, you expect it to be out in the middle of a really freezing, frigid, cold place, but um, actually it keeps them from freezing as cold as you do further inland. So they're zone 6B or 7 here. And so that means that, that she can plant roughly the same hardiness plants that I can down in Baltimore, which is shocking to me. And also Tulsa is zone seven. Really? Yes. So again, just a reminder that the USDA hardiness zone only talks about winter temperatures. They don't talk about summer temperatures. There is another scale for heat hardiness, but almost no garden centers label their plants with the heat zones. And I don't even know what my heat zone is, but I know that my heat zone is different from yours because your average high in the summer is 77 degrees. <laughs> I learned as I was looking at stats the other day. So, yeah, you have a different hardiness for heat here, but cold, we're just about the same. Okay, let's look over this way. Here's another beautiful hydrangea that has not really kept its yeah, color, time, but that's okay. We had kind of a humid late summer. It got hit kind of hard, but it um, it's a ever-blooming hydrangea. It's called Bloomstruck. Uh huh. Um, and it's a nice. It's very beautiful when it blooms. It's uh, the purple, the you know magenta range. Mm -hmm. um, last, really rich colors. Yes. Yeah. Last year it held its bloom color pretty good, but I think the humidity kind of stressed it this year. Yeah. And then you have a boxwood down yep. here. Um, Looks like winter gem or something. I think it's a newer cultivar than that. I, oh, okay. Yeah, it's not winter gem because the one in the back is a winter gem. Um, I'm drawing a blank on what the cultivar is. Yeah, but. That's okay. All right, and then over here, you've had some uh, excavation that had to be taking out some plants way down on the end of the house. But what do we have here? More of the heat. There's more heat. Yep. And some junipers. Those, uh, yeah, junipers. Those are blue star junipers. Mm -hmm. And that's Kramer's Red, the two big ones in the back. And I think these are more of the winter beauty, too white and a pink. Okay. And then tell us what happened over here that took out your... Uh, so if you come over here... What tree is this? This is a spice bush. Oh. I planted this maybe six years ago. Um, it's a native plant. Um, I really like it. It's not a flashy tree. Mm -hmm. but it's it got has, a beautiful form. It does. It's a really graceful, like kind of elegant looking thing. Yeah. Um, it's a native, so it really doesn't need any care. Uh -huh. I really have done nothing to it. Nice. I water it if it gets really dry. There's no irrigation here. Um, it gets these little buds turn into little like quarter of an inch yellow pom poms in uh -huh. the spring, pretty early spring. So it's it's got kind of a cute spring bloom to mm -hmm. it. Is it scented? Uh, it yes, it has like a spicy peppery scent. Yeah, that's imp yeah. implied in its name, spice yeah. bush. Yeah. And um, deer resistant again. Um, turns bright bright yellow. It's past it now, but turns a really bright yellow in the fall, which is nice because Cape uh -huh. Cod tends to not with all the oak trees, you don't get a lot of fall color. Yeah. Although I think we're at peak fall probably, color right now. Yeah, this is probably as good as yeah. it gets, yeah. Okay, so tell us what happened back here. So if you look, you can see we have these two roof valleys here. Yep. That they, when it rains hard, it produces an enormous amount of water that floods down into these gutters. Uh -huh. And basically the two gutters here couldn't handle the water and it was spewing out um, the end of the gutters and just created a giant puddle in that corner. Uh. So that's not good for the house. So uh, we ended up having, and we didn't do the digging ourselves. Our irrigation guy did it, which is really great of him. But he dug two trenches that go across here, uh, put in a couple of uh, tubes underground that dump the water out in the woods there. Right here. And yeah, it looks like a charm. Got rid of the puddle next to the house. Yeah, uh, we actually have the same situation at our house. We have our gutters, downspouts come into piping and goes underground down into the backyard down by the stage. Yep. Right in the middle of the lawn now. Of course, at the time it was a waste area. <laughs> now it's in the middle of the lawn. Perfect. But we did have to get, there were some other shrubs here that we ended up getting rid of when we had to yeah. do all the digging for that. So I am looking for something maybe for like over here. Mm -hmm. Haven't really researched it much. Mm -hmm. yet, but. Mm -hmm. You want evergreen or deciduous? Do you I want think flowering? Would be nice. 
Yeah. I don't, you know, it's just the window there. Um, I would kind of like it that it doesn't grow so big that it completely obscures the window. Right. So something, something that's uh, yeah. up to up to four feet tall. Yeah. And um, would you consider like a pyramid shaped thing for the corner? Like right here, some sort of pyramid Possibly. shaped thing? I mean, you could do like a taller thing in the back and then a shorter thing here maybe, or just a shorter thing here. Yeah, endless ideas. Yep. But if you have ideas for Anne, what she could put here in this garden space, let us know. This is an east-facing uh, exposure. It's acid, well-drained soil, and uh, zone 7, but uh, not very hot in the summer. Okay, let's go look at more. All right, we're going to go look uh, at the side and backyard gardens now. This is a beautiful mixed border here. So lots of beautiful things going on here. Of course, we're here in November, so we're past season, but there's still some beautiful things to look at, if not um, the flowers, at least their uh, forms and foliage. So tell us what you've got going on. Um, in the back corner here is a cardinal flower. Lobelia. Yep, that's something I just got this year. I have some in the back garden too. They did, that one got, it suffered a little with humidity, but before and after the humidity did really great. Um, that one is, uh, Vulcan red, maybe okay. red Vulcan. It's got mixed green and darker foliage. Uh -huh. This stuff here is uh, blue ice Amsonia. So those have blue, kind of fuzzy flowers. Is uh, that right? A little sort of just you know, not fuzzy. No, I'm little, thinking scabiosa. These are like little, just you know, little like if a five-year-old draws a flower. Gotcha. Blue okay. In the spring, early spring. Um, and they're yeah. dying back. They'll go back to the ground, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're a really tough plant because this, this spot is kind of hot and dry. Very mm -hmm. tough. Again, mm -hmm. if you see it in my garden, deer and rabbits don't eat it. <laughs> so good on that account. So you've given up on trying to control via spraying. Yes. You I had just, been spraying quite a lot yes. for a long time. Yeah. I used liquid fence uh -huh. that worked really great, but then I just, I got sick of the upkeep and the the stress of, oh my God, I didn't spray my garden. You yeah. know, they're going to eat all my bugs. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yep. I just decided to go with the floor. Yep. Yep. All right. So blue eyes and Sonia. And then this looks like a, it's a meadow sweet Philip uh, blue, um, oh no, red umbrellas is the name of it. Okay. Red um, umbrellas, Philip That's another new one. It, kind of seemed like it suffered in the humidity the late summer too where the leaves got kind of ratty looking yet it keeps putting out new leaves and new blooms so I guess it's okay I might try it in another location next mm -hmm. year and then some um, geranium yep that's a uh, big root geranium it's a white variety I want to say it's just like Albion or something okay it doesn't it stays I like that one I used to have the the pink kind that would get like get much larger. This one stays fairly low and it's a little easier to control. So I like this one better. Mm -hmm. Has little white blooms on stalks in the spring, mm -hmm. early spring. Mm -hmm. What's this here? Is this a, um, it's an, an anemone. anemone? It's a honoring jolly bear anemone. Okay. It has, uh, this is also one here. That's the seed pods after it blooms. Um, Pretty. Yeah, they, they have a nice like daisy-like white flower in the center in uh, probably late August through, it probably bloomed through probably the end of October. Now some people have trouble with anemones spreading through the garden. Do you have trouble with that? Um, I could see how it could happen. I guess I kind of just hack it back a little every year if it gets too out of control. But yeah, yeah I could see there are, they are can be kind of an aggressive plant. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like them because, you know, late summer, deer resistant, um, and they also don't really need any support. We had a windstorm, which is why this one's tilted and that one fell over. But short of that, they really don't need any staking. Yeah. At least I haven't needed to do and it. And they take shade to part shade, right? Yes. They don't need full sun. Yeah, all this garden is probably 50-50. Yeah. So I think I'll be adding some of those to my garden. I don't have any quite yet. Now you've got some just beautiful begonias yeah, that just, are still putting out color. Yep, they're great. They, um, first of all, they are just bulletproof plants rabbits deer don't touch them you know shady sunny hot you know wet dry mm -hmm. they're just like they're like my go-to uh -huh. plants uh -huh. and they bloom 
You have to start annuals kind of late here because of the cold springs, mm -hmm. but they'll be around from, you know, mid-May through frost. Mm -hmm. And then a still bee? Yep, I have a lot of a still bee because that's great with rabbits and deer. Yep. Um, but they require a lot of water. How do you, you, well, you have irrigation. Yeah, this is irrigated. Uh, everywhere I have it planted, I think, is irrigated. But I also, I went to all Chinese a still bee okay. varieties. Chinensis. Yes, mm -hmm. yep. And I find those require less water. Okay. They're a little, little tougher, a little more heat resistant. Good to know, because I struggle with a still bee in my dry shade yeah. area, so I really need to deal with that. What um, do we have here in this purple in the cage? That's an Augustache. Oh, it's, yeah. That's a Hyssop. Blue Boa is the name okay. of that one. It's pretty. That's, yeah, that's kind of a mid-sized one. Uh -huh. um, they have a nice scent. The whole plant gives off a nice, you know, yeah. nice scent. If you yeah, it's in the mid, it's mint family. Stomach. It's got the yeah. square stems. Yeah. Yep. That one grows to about this high. Uh -huh. um, again, it's a real easy plant, hot, dry. Yep. Yeah, you yep. leave it alone. And the hummings, birds love it. Oh, the yeah. bees, yeah. bees and other pollinators love that it. That one too, I um, I discovered this year, It I, you know, it blooms more in the summer, but I kind of just left the uh, seed heads on for interest. But then when the wind storm came, I uh, trimmed a lot of them back and it actually forced some reblooms. So uh -huh. I think next year I need to. I trim think them all agastaches will rebloom after the first flush. Okay. Um, so if you're trying to save the seed heads for seeds, right. do it on the last flush of the yeah. season. Um, and I'm told that at least some of these cultivars will self seed around your garden. I have Golden Jubilee and Blue Fortune, and both of those are known for self seeding. I don't know if this one will or not. Have you found I haven't it? noticed any yet. Yeah. And then more stilby. So these again, another Chinese stilby. Yep. And more begonias, and more geranium, and more stilby. Some variety down here. Yeah. This is the variegated one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Generally, they get a something's of eating it. Yeah, you're excited <laughs> to check that one out, which yeah. we do from time to time. Sure. Oh, there's some more variety clumps down that way too. Yeah. Yeah, I have this variegated one. I really like it. Yeah. It's a little more yellow when it's in full sun, which yep. is where mine are right now. Yeah. And then what's this red bush here? That's also an astilbe. That's oh. a regular astilbe. It's a chocolate shogun. Okay. Um, that one's, this corner here is quite shady, so it does well. Chocolate shogun. I'll have to yeah. think, look for that one because I love the color of the foliage. Yeah, is it green in the summer? No, or? it is really dark chocolate. Oh. Yeah, it's really pretty. So then it lightens up to red in the fall. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. This is a color flash astilbe that was supposed to turn red. Uh -huh. the, the foliage, but it really didn't do it. I don't know why. That's huh. new this year. So. Maybe this one is starting to get some Maybe. red. Maybe. And then some of your stilbies are green that turn yellow. Yeah. And like here's, uh, what's this? It's a uh, tiarella. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Foam flower. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great plant. That one gets eaten by rabbits. I would have a great plant for dry, complete shade great plant. Mm -hmm. I would have it everywhere if it didn't get eaten by rabbits. Mm -hmm. Here I think it's kind of protected by the yuckiest still be. So. Do you find that to be the same with heucheras also as far as the rabbits? I gave up on heucheras because they got they just got mowed down. Yeah. Do you suffer slugs or snails here? Yeah a lot of both. Yeah, yeah. and earwigs. Not as much no. earwigs but some. So how do you manage your foliage? I don't actually you know what one thing I don't see here is a hosta and that's probably from the deer. And uh, so you're not suffering slug damage on your leaves because you're not growing slug bait <laughs> like I do. <laughs> I had, I used to have a lot of the wild ginger, which there's a little patch behind here. Wild ginger, let's look for you. Oh yeah, there she is. Yep. That gets heavily victimized by slugs. Yeah, I, I see a little of, bit of holes there. Yeah. yeah. I used to have more of that. Kind of, the geraniums are good. The slugs don't bother the big root geranium at all. Oh, good to know. Yeah. Slugs in my garden are as common as leaves. <laughs> All right, moving around into the backyard here. Beautiful lawn. And, and then you're backed by woods and about a third of an acre back there is woods. And that leads into, what is the punk horn? It's a conservation area. Okay. That, uh, it's around the town well fields. Um, it's about okay. 800 acres altogether, a lot of trails. Okay, so of course it also has a lot of deer and other wildlife. What kind of wildlife do you have here besides deer and rabbits? Um, well, a lot of coyotes. Interesting. Yeah, a lot. They come in your yard? Uh, I have seen them, yeah. yeah. Um, but they're not bothering your garden as much as oh, they're no. looking for yeah. food yeah. of it's the not mammal a good place variety. You really can't let your 
pets outside. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Even with a fence, I guess. Although I don't see many fences in this neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Um, and these woods are gorgeous. The sun comes up over the house and lights up the trees from top down to the bottom. And um, it's just so beautiful to sit in your sunroom and enjoy the sun coming up on the t onto the trees from behind. It's just gorgeous. So um, tell us about your gardens back here. You've got a little bit here with a rhododendron. Yeah, that's another yak rhododendron. That one's a yak prince rhododendron that's pink instead of white. The ones okay. in the front are white. All right. And then around on this side is where most of the garden is. Let's walk over there. So we're back here in this little nook area that is created by the way the house is a uh, footprint on the land. And there's this little garden here and it's just a masterclass in how to use a stone pathway or any kind of pathway to demark or have demarcation. Is demark a verb? I don't know. Anyway, um, to kind of separate into little garden beds. And I absolutely love the way Anne has put together the plantings back here. Let's take a closer look. All right, so I was just telling Anne that um, in my garden, I have like three of this kind and three of that kind and three of those and two of those and one of those and maybe that over there. And my garden is much more of a plant collector's garden is the nice way to say it. And much more chaotic is maybe the less generous way to say it. But your garden is really, I would call this very well organized, beautiful in choice of structure and form compared to, you know, what's planted beside each other. I love, 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 love the different textures you've got going on. I love the big size of the swaths of plants that you've got going on. And the way it just draws your eye around the garden is really, really well done, Anne. So okay. it is beautiful. So tell us what you've got in here. So this garden is on the west side of the house, so it does get some pretty intense afternoon sun. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff in the back, you know, gets less sun, so I have uh, stuff that can function with a little shade back there. And then up here in the front, I went with annuals, because this is the sunniest garden spot I have mm -hmm. um, in the whole yard. And again, my old friend, the begonia. Um, I did have azure atoms in there earlier that also do good in their deer mm -hmm. and rabbit proof. Mm -hmm. um, they they don't last as long as the begonias. They quit earlier in the year, so I pulled them. Mm -hmm. And then the other plants I have here up in the front are this. This is a. It's not a plant that I, you see very often. It's a potentilla herbaceous plant, huh. um, but it has just really adorable foliage. It's really um, striking foliage. Yeah. It looks like it's kind of. Um, crinkled yeah. like a ripples potato chip yeah ruffles it, potato chip yeah it's a little silvery tinge to it so i have it yeah. more for foliage although it does get little tiny red flowers on kind of tall stalks but it's actually inside. not crinkled foliage oh it's it not. looks like it is but it's actually smooth oh, you're right. with uh markings that oh. make you think that it looks like a ruffles potato chip from afar mm -hmm. but it's actually not so that's really very interesting and you said it's a potent a deciduous potent yes. Yeah. I think these are red. I think it also comes in a yellow. Huh. I've never seen anything like it. It's really pretty. It. So you're using, like you said, uh, for foliage kind yeah. of interest on the front here yeah. next to the lawn. And then begonias, and you said Amsonia, and then here's another agastache, right? Yep, yeah, that's the same kind, uh, the blue boa. And that's a really pretty color of purple, kind of. Well, the camera's not picking up the true color, but there's a little bit of pink in on the on the calyxes, and then the petals are more of a purple. The outside is a softer, silverier purple, and then the inside is more of a deep purple, which the camera is just not picking up. But anyway, I see three or four different shades of purple pink in that, and it's really very pretty. It's a nice one because it doesn't get too huge that it flops over. I have some blue fortunes over there that uh -huh. uh, I cut back because they flopped over in the windstorm, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, they need a lot of support. I have yeah. to put tomato cages around those. Those do really well too. Yeah. Um, but this one's a nice one because it only gets about three feet. Yeah. All right, and then you've got little sections created by your pathway. And I have to say, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's look at these. What do we have here? Okay. These are Stoxia, um, Stoxia, which is a purple, is really nice, large, kind of fluffy purple blooms in July. Um, I don't I don't think I know what Stoxia looks like. I'm going to have to look that up and put an image up on the screen. It's got kind of a basil leaves yeah. and strappy yeah. 
and clump forming, and then do they spread? They they expand yes, the size yeah, of the clump. Right? Yeah, they don't they don't die out in the center, which is nice. They just kind of gradually get bigger and bigger. Uh -huh. They're a very tough plant. Um, my irrigation system was actually not adjusted correctly for like the first half of the summer, and I think that's why they're a little ratty. Normally, they're more like this. Oh. You know, I wouldn't have called them ready. Uh, now, when they're blooming, do the bloom stalks come up and make a mass, or do they still have separate, like the the clumps are separate? Um, you think they're, they're kind of like a mass. They, the nice. blooms will be about this high. Nice. Oh, really? Yeah. So like two or three feet? Yeah. Nice. There's a lot of different cultivars of that, too. I don't... These were ones a friend of mine gave me, and I just kept dividing it, so I don't know which cultivar these are. Okay. But there's a lot of variety. I think they come in white and purple. Okay. And yours are purple? Yep. Yeah. And then you've got this beautiful sea of liriope here. Yeah. This is a variegated one. This is the same one I have. And so, yeah, this one's more yellow than it was over on yeah. the side yeah. of the garage. But you've got your um, fish sculpture swimming in your sea of liriope, which I just find to be really cute. And that, Cute's not the right word, but I like it a lot. <laughs> that had a nice, you know, mass of purple blooms in September. Yes. It bloomed really well. Yeah. And then back behind there, it looks like we've got Lady's Mantle. Yeah. And then more ginger. Right. That's a really dark corner that really doesn't get any sun to speak of. It's mm -hmm. just a little slug nest mm -hmm. back there. So mm -hmm. the ladies' mantle's a little bit more resistant to the slugs than the ginger is. Mm -hmm. um, and they have the nice yellow blooms in the spring. Mm -hmm. I think we used to have some wild ginger, but it's been weeded out by now, I think. All right. And then right here, uh, down on the low front border, this is germander, right? Yep. And that has spiky pink blooms in July or uh -huh. so. And I th then um, I think some people use this as an approximation for a low boxwood hedge. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. It works great for that. Um, so after it blooms, I mow it back with the hedge trimmer okay. and then it just fills out more and really looks like a hedge. Nice. Nice. And then behind it, that's another variety of Amsonia. Um, I think it's called storm cloud. Uh, again, it has little these are lighter blue than the other ones, little small clusters of light blue flowers in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's just one of those plants that's really nice form, graceful. Mm -hmm. um, and it does turn a really bright yellow in the fall, which is kind of nice too. Yeah. It looks like a plant that would uh, be very pretty, especially in your windy climate. Yeah. Because you yeah. get a lot of wind here. Oh, yeah. Still days are rare. Yes. In fact, today is pretty still, all, pretty things, still. Consil yeah. all things considered. Yes. And um, so it's nice to have a billowy plant. And, and that's what makes this interesting, too, because I'm sure the liriope blows in the wind mm -hmm. and makes it look like waves on the water. Another egg stash back there. Yep, it's another blue boa. Yep. I have a couple of uh, meadow rues, I think. Oh, yeah. Those are thelictriums yeah. planted in there. Yeah. And yeah. Those, those grow up, you know, this tall, mm -hmm. three feet three, four feet tall in the spring mm -hmm. with poofy pink blooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They kind of die back in the uh, summer and I just cut them down and they just mm -hmm. stay dormant until mm -hmm. next spring. Mm -hmm. So that works out good. They're camouflaged mm -hmm. by the Amsonia. Mm -hmm. And then I just have some Estilbe in here. Mm -hmm. um, what color amazing. flowers are these It's ones? like a bright fuchsia. Nice. Magenta. Um, so you've got a pink and purple and white theme going on in your garden too. Yeah. Just like me. I would say so. The, <laughs> I tell you what I lack is a yellow flower. I can't have, n I'm looking everywhere for yellow flower that doesn't get eaten by rabbits and deer and I have yet to find one. Hypericum. Try that. St. John's wort. Okay. They come in all different sizes. I thought that was a shrub. It comes in smaller sizes okay. than that. I have one called Miracle Horizons and it, um, it's in its second season and it's only about two by two right okay. now. And I don't think it's going to grow much bigger. It might get thicker, but probably not much bigger. Okay. So look for that. Right and then you get the benefit of the berries for that, too. Okay. Um, and then, let's see, more ladies' mantle and more anemones. And what is that with the spikes in the back there? Uh, those, these two are blue lobelias. Oh. And yeah. that's a cardinal flower. Those yeah. were new this year, but they did fantastic. Nice. Uh, really, I don't think I've ever had... That's just a species generic cardinal flower, uh -huh. and it grew up to about five feet. Yeah, right I don't on the. Think I've ever had a plant with red or blue. That right on the fireplace is a nice place for that too. Keeps it uh, protected a little bit from wind as much as you can. Um, yeah. Up against the house yeah. there, and then behind you, you've got another boxwood, yeah. some amorabilia. This one's a variegated. This one might be a green gem, I think. That's. Uh, I think it's a limeade avelia, okay. limeade or lemonade. It does have that limey color yeah. in the variegation. Yeah. 
yeah. new growth it looks like it comes yeah. out a, a more chartreusey limey color yeah. then fades more to a mm-hmm. green and white this looks like it might be a japanese holly no that's no? a boxwood i think boxwood. that might be a green mountain green mountain conical yeah and then vinca yes. has good ground cover yep. and then more still be here pretty what do we have here that's all catnip oh nice do you know which one no, because that was some of it was here, and I just kept dividing it. What was here? Yeah. It's kind of I think just a very. Does it get really huge? I mean, not huge, huge, but I mean. It gets, I did cut it back some, so yeah. It's blue and it's probably the stall. Yeah, I have walkers low, and that's about how big mine gets. But I don't have mine mass planted like this, and so it flops. I have one just in like two foot clump, and so the leaves, the the flowers grow up and then fall. <laughs> I should mask them like you have yours masked. This is another one where when I started cutting it back, it started reblooming. Uh-huh. Like, and I think next year I'm going to cut it back even more aggressively. Yeah, I got three blooms out of my nepeta. So, yeah, they're, they're really good for that. And now here is a um, winterberry, right? Yes. Yeah. That is a cultivar. So we had some wild ones out in the front, in the woods out front. But these two are, um, are they the same cultivar yep, as each other? red sprite. Red sprite. So look at the mass of berries. It's just such a beautiful, bright spot. And the green leaves are falling off, leaving the stems, the gray stems with the red berries on them, just really thick berries on there. And then tell us what happens when it snows. Well, so the leaves fall completely off. So you just have these shrubs with just red berries on them. And that, if you get snow cover, it looks stunning. To see the berries like waving in the wind in the snow is still, like incredible. Um, but then they stay on, the birds and deer ignore them, and then something around January, they must ripen, and somehow the birds know this, and the birds just descend on the berries in a flock, and they're like gone in two days. <laughs> and so if you're a, a seasonal decorator for the Christmas holiday, this is a beautiful plant to have in your garden because it's timed exactly right for cutting stems off, bringing them indoors, putting them in vases or wreaths or whatever. And then by January, when the birds come for them, it's okay, because you don't need them anymore. <laughs> All right, so what else do we have to look at? And tell us more about your yard. Um, well, this area here, uh, the lawn just ends, and we just it's just natural. There's some uh, oregano plants that were here when we bought the house that just they're just they just spring up here and there. But they have nice kind of white flowers that, you know, I don't mind having them out there. Um, and then this area, that's actually a lawn sprinkler that comes this way. But just the runoff from that made that corner just a weedy mess. So I put some, I figured, well, I might as well plant something and take advantage mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. So I have butterfly weed, which mm-hmm. is the uh, orange, Asclepius. bright orange. Mm-hmm. Yes, Asclepius. Mm-hmm. Goes about that big, bright orange flowers, mm-hmm. July, probably July mm-hmm. to August. They're food for caterpillars, yeah, for butterflies. Yeah. They get loaded with caterpillars mm-hmm. and I guess produce a lot more butterflies. So that's good. They also, those self-seed, they're springing up all over there. And then I had three Blue Fortune Augustosh that we mm-hmm. get about this big. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just a few. And the hummers love those too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you get hummingbirds, you get all, I, and we enjoy the birds watching the bird feeders. Sorry, watching the birds on the bird feeders every morning. Well, really all day. Um, But you say that you get hummingbirds, you get all sorts of woodland birds, lots of songbirds, woodpeckers. You get a a really wide variety of birds. We've gotten some really unusual birds. There was an indigo bunting here one year that just like, they printed it in the paper and like bird watchers were like popping up everywhere. And he did come to the feeder. Wow. That was kind of cool. Wow. But I guess we're on a migratory path. So you do get a lot of like birds pass through that mm-hmm. you, you know wouldn't normally see like mm-hmm. we got gross beaks last year which i hadn't seen at gross beaks uh-huh. since i was a kid uh-huh. you know but they showed up last year so and it's just really fun we were watching with our morning coffee the other day and at least five or six different varieties of birds on the feeders at the same time and up in the trees taking their turn waiting and coming and going the woodpeckers climbing up the trees to find in their bugs and then coming down for a little bit additional suet or whatever and just really a beautiful um, situation going on here a lot of bluebirds in the winter which is nice, nice. that's mm-hmm. nice um, so then your property goes back into the woods a little bit probably you said another third of an acre maybe back in there and you have a pathway and so with your yard waste you were telling me you don't keep a compost pile what do you do with your yard waste um we just uh kind of 
essentially composted out in the woods. This area behind this uh, conservation land now, it used to be uh, cranberry bogs. And one thing around cranberry bogs is they, they put sand on top of the cranberry plants in the winter to protect them. And so around the edges of the cranberry bogs, there's always like big sand pits where they dug out the sand. And there's one, there's one behind that house and there's one behind our house. And I use that to dispose of my yard waste where it's, it's essentially a big compost pile. I haven't been bringing it back for our yard because we also live on the road to the dump, which <laughs> gives away free compost. That's fantastic compost. Yeah. That they make that they take everyone's yard waste, shred it, mix it with sand, age it, and then you can just go pick it up for free. Nice. So that is such a benefit. Yeah, we've imported buckets and buckets of compost. Now the trouble sometimes with municipal compost is that you don't know what's in it. And so if people are using Roundup or other harmful mm -hmm. things like that you might end up with some residual chemicals in there that you're unaware of. So I understand that some people, when they bring in compost, they might do some test plants in pots and see, uh, compare the new compost with some soil that they can trust and see if the new compost performs up oh, to wow, snuff. That's interesting. I've never heard that. I don't think I've ever had a problem with it, but yeah. That's, that's good. That's yeah. good. Uh, I think I heard that on Charles Dowding's website um, or YouTube channel. He's a big no dig guy in England. Um, so yeah, but it's nice to hear that you haven't had any trouble with that either, because um, I know that in a lot of communities that can be an issue. Um, and then you have walking paths in the woods that go into the conservation area and you can take nice little nature hikes and things like that. So we're almost done with the tour of the yard, but um, actually there's a little bit more to see down there. Um, but I, w I do want to just step into the woods for just a second and show some things that we don't have in Maryland. So the pathway into the woods has beautiful green moss and um and then the trees all over the cape have this beautiful green lichen it's silvery green color and it's just so interesting looking this little i don't know what it is i'm going to try to do some plant id on it and see if i can figure out exactly what kind it is but all over the woods in the cape you see trees with this kind of lichen on it and then there's another one it looks more like moss and this just grows all over the trees here and um, you can see it up well I can't see it right now of course I say that here's a tree that fell down recently so of course it's on the trunks there I'm looking for the fuzzy ones though yeah, hard to see when the leaves are still on. Yeah, I saw some over there in that tree over there so anyway the uh, here, let me zoom in here. This tree just fell recently, but it's still got its stuff all over it. So all the trees up in the canopy have this kind of growth going on. And it's just so pretty. I don't know, maybe it's just me that gets excited by things like that, but we don't have that in Maryland. We do get kind of a green, like moldy moss on the side of our trees in the dense wooded damp areas, but nothing like this. And I think, it has to do with the climate here, the salty air, and um, whatever wild flora they have here that we don't have in Maryland. So, um, and it has given me permission, I'm gonna actually go out a little bit later today and do some foraging back here in their woods and bring home some of this stuff and see if I can use it in my holiday decorating. And here we're seeing remnants of a raised bed garden that used to be here and is no longer here because of a tree that fell, he said? No. I just kind of decided I. Yeah. <laughs> there well, you actually, go. Actually, one reason I decided to get rid of them was because the trees here have been growing, and when we moved here, they got a lot of sun. Uh, they were great to grow in, and now they gotcha. really. The, I've yeah. had less and less good results because they're getting really shady. Yeah, that makes sense with the height of the trees back there now. So if you've been here almost 15 years, then yeah, 15 years ago, those were probably half the height they are, or maybe two thirds the height they are now. That makes a lot of sense. All right, and then there's one more part of your garden that um, we can maybe go down the lower hill area. This is kind of a secret garden. When you're up yeah. on the lawn, you can't really see it. No. Little grotto area. It's pretty. He got um, begonias and some ground cover and it looks like some more stilbies. Tell me what else I'm missing. Um, there's a lot of stilby. Uh, some more of the chocolate shogun and the other varieties they have up above too. Uh, this is a speedwell. It's um, but it's supposed to be speedwell can be really invasive, and this is supposed to be a sea sterile variety. Huh. No, water Perry's blue is the name. Water Perry blue. Water Perry blue. But I got it because I'm, I am 
concerned about like having garden plants colonize the woods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a seed sterile one, um, but it's you know pretty aggressive grower. If you want to fill in and cover stuff, it's great. And it does have these tiny little pale blue blooms in the spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then. Uh, Oh, I also, I had Joe Pieweed in the back. Those are big stalks, the big stalks. Mm -hmm. um, that gets five to six feet tall, mm -hmm. which here was kind of cool because it, from like the deck up there, you could see it. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't see anything down there. Right. Um, however, it's, I think it's getting really aggressive and it's going to get out of control. Uh. Um, so I think it's going to end up taking over the garden. So I'm thinking of maybe... Well, maybe you could just dig out a half of each clump, the front half of the clump. It's really hard to dig out. Oh. It's like it's like busting through rocks. Oh. Well, that makes sense because it's a prairie native, yeah. right? So it has to be strong to withstand a prairie condition. It is a native plant, so if it didn't yeah. propagate in the woods, it's okay. But... Yeah. Is it native to Cape Cod? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You see it, uh, there's a park area on another road in Brewster that's just loaded with it. Hmm. All right. Have we reached the end of your garden tour? I think so. Yeah. Well, Anne, thank you so much for showing us around your beautiful garden. You're welcome. Um, it's just lovely. I love everything you've done here. In fact, um, my gardening efforts have been really um, encouraged by you. You may not remember this, but when I was a very first time homeowner, and I had in mind that I wanted to learn how to garden, we would come up and visit up here and. You gave me a paper grocery sack full of Better Homes and Gardens magazine. And I took those home and I poured over those. So it was probably like three years worth of a subscription. And I read every single article. I cut out pictures. I made a scrapbook of all the plants that I wanted. And that really jump-started my knowledge about gardening. Of course, I've learned so much more since then. That, was, um, that would have been in 1990. Um, so yeah, thank you, Anne, oh, well, you're because welcome. you got me started on my gardening pathway. So who knew? who knew you never know what kind of influence you're going to have on a person. So always give them everything you can, um, and share your joy with them. And then you never know what you're going to spark in somebody else. That's the lesson there. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Thank you for joining us today at Harmony Hills Home and Garden. I hope you enjoyed the tour around Anne's garden as much as I do. And I'll see you in another video real soon. Maybe Anne will be in it, but maybe not. I don't know what we have planned here. So we'll see you again soon, friends. Bye. Thanks.